Lady Bottomley, just to conclude on the HIV litigation, a, a point that we will no doubt pick up with Mr. Waldegrave or Lord Waldegrave mm -hmm. next week, uh, is it right that you weren't particularly involved in the negotiations that led to the final settlement in November and December 1990? I think that's true. I mean, when Mr. Waldegrave came, as you would expect from a fellow of all souls, he um, uh, uh, applied his great brain to this problem and on the whole worked on his own with a small number of officials. So I took no exception for, to that at all, but he was evidently making really good headway, and I think what he achieved was really impressive. Um, and uh, congratulated him at the time. So no difference in policy between you and Mr. Waldegrave on that point? No, no difference. I mean, he obviously came in, I think like a lot of new ministers, probably through the whole of this chronology, when they start, they think, I want to solve this. And then there was a, a moment, I think, because after Mr. Justice Ogmore's um, statement, um, the fact that we were going to fight on at the same, so there was a reality check for everybody. And then, as I say, within a week of Mr. Waldegrave taking over, we had the proposals for agreement. So, I mean, that was an excellent combination. And I'm sure the new prime minister Again, uh, John Major wanted this resolved. And um, so no disagreement and nothing but, um, you know, admiration and, and, and pleasure that so much was achieved. So much more was achieved than I had anticipated. Well, I know it will never be enough. Uh, on that point, do you think that the government would have agreed to an additional £42 million in spending for the McFarlane Trust had it not been for the litigation? I can imagine that the litigation may have been quite a significant factor. There was a desire to bring the litigation to a conclusion. I've said it repeatedly, I'm sorry, but for the infected and affected, going through litigation is a wretched business. And this had to be brought to a conclusion, and I'm delighted it was. So there are times when extra action delivers extra money. Similarly, if we think back to November 1989, part of the reason for the additional 24 million at that time was also because of the, the overhanging threat of litigation. Is that fair? Yes, I think also there was strong, there was a strong campaign in Parliament. Senior backbenchers felt very strongly about this. Uh, Robert Key, we've mentioned, um, Sir John Hannam, I was referring to, Geoffrey Johnson-Smith. These were serious, responsible backbenchers who didn't pick up any campaign. They, they were campaigning because they really cared. And as I think what you've already referred to at the, at the beginning, uh, there was somebody in my household who felt pretty strongly about this. Let's move on, then, to people who did not have haemophilia but who had contracted HIV through blood transfusion and, and blood products. If we could go, please, to DHSC 302859 underscore 002. This is a letter that you wrote to Sir Peter Emery, MP, uh, in response to a letter from him dated the 19th of March uh, 1990. Your letter is dated the 6th of April 1990 which is a, a letter that was pushing the case for an extension of the, the payment scheme to people who did not have haemophilia. What you write in your letter is this, picking it up from the second paragraph. The position at the end of January 1990 is that there have been 101 reported cases in England and Wales and Northern Ireland of an individual becoming infected by HIV as a result of a blood transfusion. However, of those, only 17 were transfused in the UK, 35 were transfused abroad, and the place of transfusion for the remaining 49 is not known. There have been 18 reports from England and Wales and Northern Ireland of people developing AIDS following transfusion in the UK. Uh, of course, 15 are known to have died. I have the greatest sympathy for those who have become HIV positive through blood transfusions. However, the ex gratia payments given to provide help for haemophiliacs with HIV in their families recognised their wholly exceptional circumstances. Haemophiliacs were already suffering from a serious disorder which affected their employment prospects and insurance status. 
they had little opportunity to insure their lives or their mortgages or to build up savings in order to provide for their dependents. These difficulties have been compounded by the onset of HIV. Also, the hereditary nature of haemophilia can, and in some cases does, mean that more than one member of the family may be affected. This combination of circumstances does not generally apply to those who have unfortunately become infected with HIV through blood transfusions. I think it's fair to say that that is the departmental line, as it were, at that time. I'm not We've suggesting that you personally drafted this letter. I didn't personally draft that letter, but it did reflect that we'd had, we had to have a boundary. We had to have a ring fence. And the haemophilia uh, ring fence seemed the fairest, all things considered. But I do agree, as time went by, with the new um, remedies for HIV and AIDS, and this, maybe this is a bit later, and the new developments, what people understood later about um, Hep C, uh, then you know somehow there was a convergence of people's ex of, of people's experience. But this was at the time of it. This was our line. I would say that a month later, I was just seeing. I'd asked Mr. Canavan to find out, uh, asked him a question about what different countries were doing in terms of people who contracted HIV and AIDS through blood transfusion. And that was a long way ahead of any settlement being considered, but I was thinking, I need to know more. We'll, we'll come on to that in a second, mm. but can I just ask you to reflect on, on the departmental line mm. as stated there? Do you think that it was a, a, a logical and justifiable line to draw? I think it was the most defensible line that could be conceived on the basis that we'd already established a precedent. Any precedent, it, it, there has to be a moment when, reluctant as I am, am to, make pre to uh, uh, introduce a precedent, we needed a boundary. And the haemophiliac um, aspect was the boundary. So should we understand the line was drawn because a line had to be drawn somewhere? Indeed. Exactly that. Better put than me. That line, as, as we will see, came under consistent Honestly. and sustained uh, attack. We'll come back to the international comparisons that you, you made it, uh, in a second. Um, but it, it's right, isn't it, that, uh, and as you set out in your statement at... Um, pages 67 to 75. Are we moving away from this letter now? Uh, I, I will be in a second, sir, yes. Is there something that you'd like to pick up from it? Well, th there is, actually. It's just a curiosity. It, it's um, nothing to do with the questions you've just been asked directly. But in, in the first large paragraph, uh, only 17 were transfused in the UK. That's the, third, mm. the fourth line. And then the, just below that, there have been 18 reports of people developing AIDS following transfusion in the UK. So if indeed HIV, as we understand, is the cause of AIDS, can you, can you help to explain the difference in how more people have got AIDS than actually got it after transfusion? I don't think I can. But what I, what I would point out here is one of the complexities of this is the numbers who were transfused abroad Yes. Which does make it quite difficult in turn. People are always talking about justice. The fact you've been transfused abroad means that you wouldn't uh, be subject for assistance. And that if you've been transfused in the UK, you would. I mean, I, 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 mm. I'd wondered to myself whether the developing AIDS following, following transfusion might, <coughs> might relate to um, family members. For instance, a, a mm. man uh, infected um, mm. infects his partner. Um, or vice versa, but uh, it doesn't really fit with the language. So presumably this comes to you from your, uh, your civil servants. It, it, it does come from the civil servants, and I would normally have checked it, and I um, stand rebuked for not having picked the point up myself, and I will investigate subsequently, <laughs> even 33 years later. So I'm just looking at that sentence, sir. If, if the last three words in the UK were removed, then it 
could make sense that there have been uh, 101 reported cases of HIV infection and 18 reports of people developing AIDS. Except the, in, the, in the UK, should then have come after of people in the UK yes, developing AIDS exactly. following transfusion. But, but with those three words, there's no way of squaring that circle, it no. seems to me. Mm. We will, we will see what we can find out uh, <laughs> on that at this distance. Uh, I, I, I don't think in the great scheme of things it'll matter very much. But no. It's just a, a curiosity, and uh, it's just it, it confirms my impression, which may may matter more, that the substance of this came from the civil servant. Oh yes, this is this is a civil service letter. I'm not denying that. I acknowledge that. Um, we can see from your your statement that the, that line was held through 1990 uh, and late into 1991 and then on the 2nd of December 1991 uh, Mr Waldegrave as he then was mm. wrote to Mr Mellon, Mellon. we've looked at that correspondence uh, do you know what it was that prompted a, a shift in at least external position from Mr Waldegrave at that time I don't, because he was holding the line for much of the year um, through uh, much um, uh, scrutiny and pressure. But he evidently come to a conclusion that now was the time that he should try and bring this other matter, injurious matter, to a conclusion. I'd always thought he might have been speaking to the Prime Minister as well about it, but there was no minute of that. Uh, we, we will pick that up with, with Mr. Waldegrave. Mm. Um, but just dealing with, with your involvement at that time, um, if we turn to page 76 of your statement, I don't ask that this be brought up, but just so that you have it to hand, you record two submissions, which I'm sure again will be picked up with Mr. Waldegrave. The first is from Mr. Heppel, date of the 29th of November 1991. Uh, and this is in response to a, a shift, an internal shift in policy being indicated by Mr. Waldgrave within the department. Mm. And Mr. Heppel wrote that, uh, and I quote, the Secretary of State will want to reflect on the financial and policy aspects of the letter before he writes it. And then... Uh, a little later, on the 2nd of December 1991... Uh, 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 just a moment. People, I think, may not be able to follow if it's not on the screen. OK, we'll, we'll um, bring it up then, please. WITN 5289001, page 76. So this is uh, paragraph 4.153. Uh, and it's dealing with the draft letter that Mr. Waldgrave is proposing to send to Mr. Meller, indicating a shift in the policy to allow for a payment of, of £12 million pounds to cover trans, uh, transfusion patients, to, to use a shorthand, which is not wholly accurate, but we'll do for now. Um, Mr. Heppel's submission of the 29th of November 1991 wrote that the Secretary of State will want to reflect on the financial and policy aspects of the letter before he writes, and then sets out his concerns both about the finances and about losing the ring fence uh, that the existing policy mm. represented. And then if we go over to the next page, please, paragraph 4.154. A few days later, Sir Christopher France, the Permanent Secretary, sent a minute to Mr. Waldegrave's private office, uh, again stressing the importance of the, of the ring fence uh, around the payments towards people with haemophilia, uh, and says at the end of that quotation, I advise long reflection before we move further into no-fault compensation for medical accidents. Uh, the language is, is perhaps reminiscent of, of yes, minister, but... Um, are we right to read this as the grade two within the Department of Health and then the permanent secretary yes. urging very careful consideration to be given by the minister to the policy that he was proposing? And I can't think of any other uh, incidents where 
the permanent secretary uh, came out with such strong words. Um, I have to say, he was a principled, impressive, um, authoritative man uh, with a real sense of justice. But he was running a, a department um, and I think was overseeing a huge number of components. And he genuinely believed that this ring fence was the most defensible that could be constructed. And if we eroded it, then it would be difficult to know what might happen next. And sometimes, I'm quite sorry for the civil servants, because ministers come and go. A minister can make an action this month, and they're in another department the next month. They've left, they've resigned, they've gone. But the, 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 the civil servants are still trying to hold an integrated policy framework for the department. So um, he would not have said this without feeling really deeply and, and, and considering it um, very seriously and discussing it with colleagues. As a minister receiving this advice from two such senior civil servants, was that a matter that weighed heavily in your consideration? It certainly did, and I think I said in my response, you know, I was really respectful of what they were saying, but nevertheless, I thought it was time to move, and I was partly doing that because that was the leadership being given by the Secretary of State. I mean, if you are the Minister of State, you can argue with your Secretary of State, but on the whole, you want to support them. And I wanted to support um, William Waldegrave on a matter which evidently was causing a great deal of suffering and pain. But I was aware that this is going to create an even tougher job defending the ring fence. If we go over to the next page of your statement, paragraph 4.158... Mr. Waldegrave sought the views of ministers. Mm. Yeah. Baroness Hooper's uh, answer was, was given in the previous paragraph, and we'll pick that up with her on Hope Thursday. But your answer on the 10th of December 1991 via your assistant private secretary mm. was that, and I quote, uh, you had always been cautious in this area for the reasons outlined in the Permanent Secretary's Minute of the 2nd of December. However, given the current circumstances, she supports, mo she supports moves seeking a further extension. Exactly. That is you supporting Mr. Waldegrave's proposal Has to extend said, the payment. Yes, and I particularly like Mr. Doral's response. Yeah, if we go down, because he said, can look at that, please. So, like, he would say it. It's, Without enthusiasm, I am in favour of extending the concession to blood transfusion, etc., victims. The initial concession was a political fix. This would simply redefine. What, is, uh, what essentially the same fix is. Mm -hmm. Although I don't, I don't really agree with them. I think I'm more with the permanent secretary that once you move off the um, haemophilia point, you are in much more flexible territory. The line was being redrawn yes. rather than erased. This is true. But were you concerned that there would be another group who would be knocking at the door. Mm, certainly, we're none of us um, medical experts as ministers, but there's a sort of sense there's always a new condition and a new virus and a new problem going to uh, emerge. And then the precedent's been set and it's even harder to hold the line. I mean, the line is that if treatment is given in good faith, according to the best scientific advice at the time, then it is not negligent, and you cannot say it's negligent if those other conditions have been satisfied. If there was bad faith, if there was erroneous scientific evidence, or um, that best practice wasn't followed, then of course that would be negligent. But these, in my humble view at the time, were not negligent. What information did you have about the actual treatment that people with haemophilia had had in the 1970s and early 1980s? and how that compared to the best standards of practice. I, I'm not an expert in... I couldn't have given you a view on the best state of cancer treatment or um, kidney disease. I couldn't have given you a state-of-the-art um, comment on best practice. I might have been able to do it more on mental health because it was my area of activity and I was particularly engaged in it. But I had no reason to believe anything other than... Um, this was a, a priority for those most involved and I had no feedback that the services were inadequate. 
If you had been told, Minister, we think that reasonable decisions were made, but there were some shortcomings. We could have achieved self-sufficiency in blood products earlier, for example. Would that have altered your view about where this line should have been drawn? No. Um, I think the line is about how far you go, haemophiliacs and blood transfusion uh, generally. Um, the issue, those matters would, I think, say more about whether or not there'd be negligence. But the, whether or not there has a, a, a strong legal case which amounts to negligence is a slightly different question from whether or not the people involved have received the best possible treatment. Mm -hmm. You can receive treatment which is not the best possible treatment without it being negligent. Mm -hmm. uh, did you ever seek information about what kind of level of treatment people have received in the 70s and the 80s? I don't think I would have asked about that unless there was a complaint. Um, the, the interesting thing about being a member of parliament is you have the most enormous volume of correspondence all the time. And you have it from your constituents, who, my experience, wherever I was a minister, everybody in my constituency became an expert on that particular subject because they liked putting me right and telling me what was happening. Uh, I've described how I came from you know, a circle, a family, a friendship group of a great number of, of medics. And nobody was saying to me, you know, this isn't good enough, Virginia. I mean, the, it was that people understood this is a, a point about payment, but not that it was a, uh, an issue around the quality of service. But we've seen in many of the documents that we've looked at that there are references to uh, patients receiving the, the best advice available mm, at the time. Exactly. Uh, these were coming from civil servants within the Department of Health, the very department that was being accused of, uh, of wrongdoing in the, in the litigation. Well, endorsed you... by the, I mean, the medical, I mean, the chief medical officer, any of those medical officers wouldn't have um, tolerated it if that was untrue. I wasn't getting, le I mean, the uh, people I was replying to, the people that Baroness Cumberledge was dealing with in the House of Lords, many of them were medics. You know, um, Lord Walton was, had been head of the General Medical Council. So uh, the, there is no shortage, particularly in the Lords, I say, uh, of um, uh, individuals telling ministers they've got it completely wrong. So I had no indication of anything other than you know, the, it was the best advice at the time. Now, there's always more. There's always a better service. I mean, the NHS does the best it can with the resources. I'm not saying it was a Rolls-Royce service, um, but I had no indication that it was anything other than best advice at the time. Just turning back to, to what you said in your answer to Mr. Waldgrave on the 10th of December 1991, you said that given the current circumstances, uh, sorry, mm -hmm. this is written in the third person, given the current circumstances, she supports moving, move seeking a further extension. What were those current circumstances, do you think? Well, I think the current circumstances was that there was overwhelming pressure and my, secre <coughs> my Secretary of State wanted to make progress on this, and I'm pleased he did. That was, probably, that was my polite way of saying that. In terms of the negotiations that then followed, you say in your statement at paragraph 4.170 that you weren't involved in those. That was for Mr. Waldegrave and Mr. Meller. Yeah, he was full steam ahead. And the um, settlement was announced in, December, uh, in February 1992. Mm. Uh, that's at 4.171 in your statement. Yeah. So that is uh, a year and a couple of months after the announcement of the HIV litigation settlement mm. in December 1990. Do you think, looking back, that that extension should have come earlier? I think initially there was a determination to hold the ring fence around haemophiliacs. We'd had a very hard time with the Treasury, and the Treasury was certainly saying, you know, one step and no further, one step and no further. So if we'd moved straight away, um, I think that wouldn't have got through the Treasury. And to do it straight away would look as though 
we hadn't thought it through when we made the original announcement. So I think this is uh, an area where a decision was made to, uh, to settle with the HIV case, haemophiliac cases, but then the, the distinction became harder and harder to justify. Just dealing briefly with the, um, the declaration of the trust deed, mm. uh, we know, and this is at paragraph 6.38, to 6.40 in your statement, that the declaration of a trust deed uh, didn't take place until the 19th of March 1993, so more than a year after the intention to commence those, uh, to extend the payments had been announced. Uh, the available papers don't suggest that you were involved mm -hmm. at the time in those negotiations, but uh, as Secretary of State by that time, you had ultimate responsibility for the Department in Parliament, didn't you? Yes, I did. Um, and I wasn't aware of this until I recently uh, been studying these papers so hard. And it did take a long time. Um, now, I can understand there, were, there are a lot of difficulties setting up trusts. Where the original uh, special payments uh, trust, there was, there was accusations of delay, but actually, you know, we'd had to get the approval of the Char Charity Commission and the trustees and the arrangements uh, in place. And I can see with the Eileen Trust, it looks as though there were a lot, a lot of work to be done. But nevertheless, it, I've said later, it does seem as though that did take longer than it should have done. You say, uh, paragraph 8.7 of your statement, but you, mm. you reach that conclusion with some hesitation mm. because you weren't involved. But is it fair to put it this way, that absent an explanation as to why it took more than a year. That does seem to you to be too long. It seems a long time. It's interesting to me, again, that uh, people weren't hammering on the door. Again, something that not everybody will understand about the way Parliament works. I mean, the reason we should never have remote voting in the House of Commons is because when you're in there voting, you, you can't get away. You know, people will just tap you on the shoulder and say, look, Virginia, you've got this all wrong. Why on earth aren't you sorting that out? You, you get your constituents badgering you, you get your colleagues badgering, you go to the select committee. No one who's a minister can sort of be in a, in a, in a cocoon. And so what interests me about this partly is that I don't know why, um, if officials weren't getting on with it or somebody wasn't getting on with it, why people didn't make more of a noise? Because there's nothing, there's nothing in it for ministers to delay we just want to get moving, get the money going out. So I find that quite a mystery. It would have been particularly important in the circumstances of the Eileen Trust, given mm, what the money exactly. was supposed to alleviate and for whom it was mm. supposed to alleviate. The means testing, the assessment of needs, yeah. Uh, and given that people had what was thought then to be a, a terminal illness, it mm. would have been important to have it. Oh, definitely. Uh, just before we leave the topic of the... Uh, extension to transfusion patients and others. Uh, you mentioned the international <laughs> compensation arrangements mm. about which you sought information in March 1990. Mm. And as you say, that's obviously some time before the, the final uh, extension was agreed. Uh, I won't take you to the documents for reasons of time, but uh, I will put on the record that they're referred to at paragraph 4.125 of your statement. Uh, and having gone through those documents, the, the outcome seems to be uh, that uh, in Belgium and the Netherlands, there was no scheme at all of uh, any form of, of payment. In France, there was a scheme for people with haemophilia, but not for others. Mm -hmm. So that would seem to be a similar position to the UK at that time. In Ireland, the same was true, but with an expectation that an extension to people who did not have haemophilia might be viewed favourably if cases were to emerge. Mm. Then West Germany, Norway, Denmark, Sweden and Australia had schemes that drew no distinction between people with haemophilia and people who had had whole blood trans... or people who did not have haemophilia. Um, I, I pause to note but not all of those schemes were funded solely by the government. Yes. Some had an element of private funding as well. Uh, in Luxembourg and Greece, there had been no claims for compensation. 
Uh, and in Spain, there was only one claim for compensation, which was currently before a court. Um, what effect did that information have on your thinking at the time? Well, why had I asked for it, more to the, in a way, more to the point? Because March 1990s, well before this is sort of publicly being considered, that we might make a move on the transfusion uh, patients. Um, and I just, I think part of my um, sort of style of working is to want to know what others are doing, to make international comparisons, you know, what's worked, what isn't working. So I think this was an it was interesting. And then when I got a reply, but I didn't get all the other countries, I then sort of chased up and said, please, will you find out about the ones you haven't told me about? And so I simply wanted to know whether all the other countries were going in the same direction, whether we were, you know, as we, it, the situation unfolded and maybe it would become inevitable that we had to do something about the transfusion payments, what was the range of uh, um, existing provision. Let's move then to ex gratia payments to those infected with hepatitis C uh, and to a period where you were mm. Secretary of State. Mm. Um, it's page 132 of your statement, if you, if you wish to have it at hand. Um, you pick up, or begin the, the story with a, a letter dated the 29th of September 1994 uh, from a member of the public about hepatitis C. So, uh, this would appear to be the first document that, that your legal team have been able to find which shows this subject being raised with you as, as Secretary of State. Uh, the department's line uh, at that time was to resist a, a further extension to people who had hepatitis C. Um, and that line was expressed in, in correspondence with MPs and with members of the public. Then, if we could have, please, on screen, WITN 5289023. This is a document which... Yes. It's dated the 30th of March 1995, and it concerns a meeting that had been held by the then Minister of State for Health, Jerry Malone. Yep. Uh, forgive me one second as I find the paper copy. Uh, what the minute, uh, the minute is sent uh, from Mr. Abrahams, who was Mr. Malone's Assistant Private mm -hmm. Secretary. Uh, and it's sent to Mr. Schofield, and it's copied, among others, to oh, your private secretary, Mr. Holden, and, and to the private okay. secretaries of other ministers and the permanent mm -hmm. secretary. Uh, we can see also to Dr. Metters, the DCMO. Yeah. Uh, and what it says is this. Uh, payments to those infected with hepatitis C through blood transfusions and blood products. Following the Minister of State for Health's meeting earlier today with John Marshall MP, Sir Geoffrey Johnson-Smith MP, and Sir Terence Higgins MP, the following action was agreed. A, there was a need for the department to give careful consideration to the issues raised. Uh, bullet point one, that those suffering from life-threatening complications, e.g. cirrhosis of the liver and liver cancer caused by hepatitis C contracted through blood transfusions and blood products, might be granted ex gratia payments. Such payments have been granted to those who contracted the HIV virus in this way. Uh, bullet point two, it would not be sensible to provide assistance to all those who have contracted the hepatitis C virus, since not all of those infected develop life-threatening complications. Mm -hmm. But at point three, consideration would, be need, would need to be given to potential triggers for government assistance. Point B, Minister of State for Health wished to discuss the matter further with the Parliamentary Under Secretary of State for Health and the Permanent Secretary, either at <coughs> top, of the office. top of the office meetings or at a specially convened meeting. C, it would be necessary to move swiftly on this matter. It would be preferable for the government to take the lead rather than be forced into action by a public campaign. Uh, I would be grateful for further advice on point 1A 
from you by 4 p.m. on Thursday the 6th of April. The Minister of State for Health would also be grateful for the Parliamentary Under Secretary of State for Health and the Permanent Secretary's views. Can I just stop you for a moment? Yes. Just because you've probably got the thing up there. I mean, one of the great complexities about Hep C was the um, second bullet. It would not be sensible to provide assistance to all those who contracted Hep C, since not all of those infected develop life-threatening complications. Um, consideration would need to be given to potential triggers for government assessment. I mean, this is, there are many reasons why Hep C and HIV were different, uh, but this is, this is certainly one of them. Yes. Uh, the meeting was with a, if I may put it this way, an, an august selection of, of backbench MPs. And, Usual suspects. Uh, but also people who carried some influence with the government. Is a that lot. fair? Yeah, very particular Sir Terence Higgins. The um, action being agreed by the Minister of State mm. for Health and the reference to the department giving careful consideration, uh, how should that be read as to what uh, Mr Malone appears to have agreed at the meeting? Well, Mr Malone is... A is and was an excellent man, but I suspect he hadn't fully read up on the sort of case law, the complexity, the history of this. Because, as you know, what happened was, um, once this minute went through, uh, alarm bells started to ring. Um, uh, Mr. Sackville, responsible minister, or their junior minister, evidently thought um, this is, this is going to end in tears. And the um, permanent secretary, for another time, sort of canters over the horizon to say, I would urge great caution or, you know, you'll never find a more comfortable ring fence. We, we'll um, go through that in, yeah, do, in a so second. What I think but, here is um, Mr. Malone, excellent man, has um, overspoken. He seeks the advice of the, the Parliamentary Under Secretary of State for Health and the Permanent Secretary, mm -hmm. but not you, the Secretary of State. Do you know why that was? <laughs> um, no, but I mean, um, Tom Sackville was the responsible minister at the time. I expect the, he knew that I would be informed. On a policy decision of this size, should the Secretary of State's views have well, been sought? Well, it wasn't sold? a policy decision. Well, so, so a potential shift in policy exactly. of this size. Had it, had, it, had it escalated, I no doubt would have been involved, as indeed I think I was in due course. But, well, but let's the, look the thing is that Tom, this is Tom, Tom Sackville's policy area. Jerry Malone, again, you know, worked extraordinarily hard, very full schedule and very full diary. I think he must have taken that meeting because of the seniority of these backbenchers. And um, as so many people do when they first see this situation, think, we must do more. And then they have a moment of reflection and think, well, what are the implications of doing more? And what is that going to do in terms of precedent and a defensible ring fence? Um, it's, it's very understandable and it's very difficult. One possible explanation as to why he didn't see your advice is that he may perhaps not have realised the full ramifications of, of mm. what this would have meant. I think that's exactly the case. Let's look then at um, how Mr Malone was invited to reflect uh, on this policy. Uh, we can pick this up from your statement, WITN uh, 5289001, page 135. Uh, paragraph 7.40. Uh, you state this, and the, the, the references are contained in the statement, so I won't laboriously read them out onto the record. They can be found at <laughs> this paragraph. Yeah. Uh, you wrote this. Uh, uh, this then appears to have led to a series of further exchanges on the issue, most of which I was copied into. These included the following. One, a message from Mr Schofield on the 30th of March, copied, among others, to my private office. And you quote... Uh, you, will, uh, wish to see, you will wish to see the Minister of State for Health has come out in favour of making payments to haemophiliacs and others infected by HCV. He has yet to convince his ministerial colleagues. I understand that Dr Metters, that's the Deputy Chief Medical Officer, uh -huh. has advised the Permanent Secretary to go for a meeting with the Minister rather than try and cover it in the margins of the top of the office meetings. 
This might mean a meeting next week rather than this. Either way, I shall move swiftly to get the papers round for comment. <coughs> Two, a paper from Mr Schofield to Gerald Malone, as had been requested, date of the 6th of April, setting out how a payment scheme could be constructed, but cautioning that such uh, a scheme was, and I quote, the exact opposite of a position that the government generally, and health ministers in particular, have taken to date. And the original have underlined uh, all of that statement. Then point three, the views of a permanent secretary by then Mr. Later Sir Graham Hart uh, conveyed to Mr. Malone date of the 6th of April 1995. The permanent secretary stated, and I quote, my recollection is that when the government conceded payments for those infected with HIV and AIDS via blood products and then via blood, a very firm line was drawn by all ministers around that scheme. It was, of course, a first step down what could be a very slippery slope towards no-fault compensation, and that is why the Treasury and others were so adamant that the line had to be defended. There will, therefore, be great resistance to any weakening of the line. Having looked at no-fault compensation, I do think it is a destination to be avoided at almost any price. It would be very expensive and it would be immensely difficult to devise such a scheme that was acceptable to the parties. Such schemes are, I believe, no longer well regarded in other countries that have them. Example, mm. New Zealand. Any concession towards hepatitis C victims would be very difficult and we should be vulnerable to further demands on behalf of those suffering from other forms of hepatitis, CJD, etc., etc., let alone from people suffering non-negligence harm, e.g. in the course of surgery. Mr. Schofield has given some thought to this, but we would need to do a lot more work to see whether a defensible and containable scheme could be devised. I have my doubts. The logical position is that if one has been harmed through negligence, the law is available for redress. If the harm is non-negligent and accidental, then there may be a substantial help available from statutory services, including Social Security, but there is no obligation on the government to provide specific schemes of assistance. The HIV stroke AIDS scheme is an exception to what is otherwise a pretty general rule, and I think it may prove easier to differentiate between the HIV and AIDS cases and the rest, though I recognise the argument is not easy than it is to draw the line somewhere completely different. I think ministers will certainly wish to discuss this very fully with officials before reaching a view. Uh, four. A minute from Mr Sackville's private office to, my, to your private office, date of 11th of April 1995. Mr Sackville said that he had seen Mr Schofield's submission of the 6th of April. He thought it was important that I was well briefed for a cabinet discussion, and he thought that Mr Hart's paper, as said out above, looked Quotes, pretty decisive. Mm. Uh, five, a further minute from Mr. Hart to Mr. Malone's office, dated the 12th of April, 1995. You quote from it. Quote, I understand the Minister of State for Health has been invited to hold a meeting on this next Wednesday, and uh, when I and a number of other officials involved are on leave. <coughs> I do not need to repeat the difficulties that would arise over any decision to concede on payments to those infected with hepatitis C by blood transfusions or blood products. Those are difficulties of principle as well as practice, and I find them pretty compelling. I recognise, of course, that the political pressures could become too great, but I think the prospects of persuading other departments, especially the Treasury, that we had to move now, are not at all good. I am sure that it would be useful to have a full discussion of the pros and cons before a decision is reached, and in the meantime, I am sure we must avoid giving any hints to anyone that our line could weaken. That could be fatal. And then a six, a minute from Mr Malone himself to Mr Sackville on the 1st of May 1995, quotes, I know we have discussed this matter relatively informally, but I thought it would be useful to have my views recorded on paper. I would firmly and enthusiastically support a strategy to resist compensation payments. I think a logical and defensible distinction could be dream drawn between HIV sufferers and hepatitis C sufferers. However, if we were to resist compensation payments, it would be catastrophic to cave in to any subsequent pressure. There are three points to bear in mind. One, a national newspaper is bound to take a campaigning stance 
with the usual constituency consequences for our parliamentary colleagues. Two, a number of supporters of the campaign are prominent backbenchers, for example, Sir Geoffrey Johnson-Smith, a member of the 1922 executive. This has a bearing on point three. Three, number 10 must be taken along at all stages and alerted both to the likely vigor of the campaign and to the fact that the PM could be faced with a powerful deputation at what might be a difficult moment. It is quite likely that this will be around party conference time or at the time of a possible challenge to his leadership. Unless these pressures are clearly understood now, we risk placing the Secretary of State in the invidious position of being obliged to back down, having initially resisted for all the right reasons. That is why we must consider the political consequences most carefully before we decide how to react. Point seven. I saw this minute and endorsed it with the observation, quote, there will always be new examples. I believe we must hold the line. For example, growth hormone, etc." Please ensure senior official talk issue through with Caroline Fairburn, also that territorial views are established. Uh, go on to say that my private secretary issued this as a request on the 5th of May 1995. Caroline uh, Fairburn was at the number 10 policy unit. Eight on the following page. A meeting was planned on the 7th of June 1995 to be led by Mr Malone to discuss the issue. On the 5th of June, Mr. Pudlow provided an update ahead of the meeting, a view of a territorial, so I won't read through all of this, but in Scotland it said that the view of officials is that while the no compensation, posi is that while the no compensation position is becoming increasingly untenable, proposals to link payments to social needs and the degree of harm suffered would be difficult to establish, and the ju clinical judgments uh, mm. required would make it costly and complex to administer. Mm, uh, an estimate of £30 million pounds is given. In Wales, legal advisers are of the view that it will be difficult to sustain rejection of claims for compensation on the grounds of a distinction between those infected with HIV and HCV. Uh, the estimated cost for Wales was around £21 million. Pounds. At Northern Ireland, official view is that it is difficult from the point of view of equity to resist comparisons with HIV compensation but this could mean a substantial drain on health resources. Uh, and then there's a comment that number 10 hadn't been fully briefed uh, and that the Prime Minister had been asked to see John Marshall, uh, to have been asked by John Marshall to receive a deputation of colleagues. And that is a point that was picked up with Sir John Major yesterday. Um, if we go to the point nine on this list, uh, a meeting on the 7th of June 1995 attended by both Mr Malone and Mr Sackville as well as Caroline Th uh, uh, Fairburn took place. Uh, although your private office was not copied in the note of the meeting, into the note of the meeting, the conclusion was, quote, there was a need for ministers to obtain a robust view of the department's ability to defend any litigation. More work needed to be done on this. However, all those present were agreed that it would be desirable to maintain the status quo and not to extend the principle of no-fault compensation either to those infected with hepatitis C or CJD. The precedent of payments to those infected with HIV, AIDS, through blood and blood products was not helpful in this context, but it was agreed that a justifiable distinction could be drawn between HIV, AIDS and other viruses. Um, so we can see that... Uh, series of, of meetings and minutes. Um, first of all, in respect of Mr Malone, uh, was this a case of him being put back into his box? Well, over speaking. And the, the note from Sir Graham Hart is again, to me, beautifully written, a uh, matter of principle, concern, it's not just a sort of superficial note. He, this is a man who's given deep thought to it. He's given thought to no-fault compensation. He refers to what happens in New Zealand. He understands the problem of defending a, a, a tricky boundary wherever it is. So it's, it's, it's a note of authority. Again, Jeremy Metters was a really impressive man. So I think that, you know, to me, Jeremy Malone had got a bit carried away, um, and they'd all thought, this won't be tricky. The point about this subject is the closer you get to it, it's really, really tricky. It's really complex. Whatever you do, the resources have to be found and the, and the precedent and, and the, and the um, boundary moves. So um, I think it was 
back came Mr. Malone and enthusiastically endorsed the uh, present situation. I know you can, um, in a way, uh, give a wry smile about the way there's a sort of Sir Humphrey tone about it all, but had Jerry Malone believed that we should go that extra step and provide uh, ex gratia payments for the, these additional patients, he would have said so. You know, he was a friend, he was an independent man, he would have said, his wife's a doctor, he would have said so. He wasn't being kowtowed, um, and I'm sure he came to that view. When I say that um, I wanted number 10 involved, simply, and this is part of no surprises, you know, if, the, if something has happened, then the next thing, the Prime Minister is suddenly uh, uh, doorstep somewhere saying, did you know Jerry Malone has come out and said we should change the policy? So I just wanted him to be aware. I think, I didn't see it, but you know, the John Marshall point about the Prime Minister is, he, he, I'm sure he wasn't thinking of changing the policy at that moment. He was receiving a delegation like we all do, uh, but there was no indication then that there was an idea of changing the policy. And as far as the territorials are concerned, who, as I say again, were, you know, there's each of them less than the size of a regional health authority. They all say, well, it's all very difficult, but we don't have any money. Um, so I guess about how it was. Looking back on this issue now, mm. do you think that you personally and the department collectively came to the right decision on not extending HCV? I think there was a really big issue that it referred to here that for the, these patients, they weren't all likely to have the same disease development. It's a much uh, more complex picture. I mean, we all, HIV, AIDS, when we started this, it was a death sentence. It was the most terrible thing. Um, this is a situation where there's a variable onset and not everybody will have the same uh, situation. So that is a really big distinction. And um, I, you can't judge the past by the present. But looking at these papers, I entirely understand with the resource situation, with our real desire not to fall down the slippery slope of no-fault compensation, not to extend these precedents, not to become like the US, uh, and to make sure that the maximum money that we had could go into service development. Um, I, um, in you know, looking at these papers, I understand why we, as a group of ministers, came to those decisions then. Leaving aside whether you can understand why you came to that decision, do you think it was the right decision at the time? I'm sure it was the right decision at the time. At the time. You said that there would be a, a range of symptoms associated with hepatitis C, uh, but you would agree, would you not, there were some people who would die as a Definitely. result of hepatitis Definitely, and the letter C. to which you referred, but the um, participants here didn't see. This was a terrible letter of a woman who I would definitely not have seen this letter myself. I've looked it up now because it's referred to in the papers, but it was from, you know, you read, you see the letters that come from all members of parliament and from various other people, but I would never have, I can't describe to you how big the mailbags, the sacks of letters that came in every day. But this is a terrible letter of a woman who had three children. One got hep C and died, and the other two got HIV and, and were surviving at that time, but it had payment. So this is really judgment of Solomon stuff. So, I mean, I completely appreciate the depth of feeling. Um, you again, as you indicated later, requested and received international comparators. Uh, this was in May 1995. It's at paragraph 7.41 uh, of your statement, in subparagraph 3 on page 142. Mm. Um, and what uh, those comparators uh, the note um, that was provided with those comparators said that no consensus had emerged concerning the way in which those who have been uh, uh, we could go down a little bit please 
so actually, sorry, if we could expand out, I, I, I've taken it too quickly. Let, let's go back to um, subparagraph two. So, uh, on the 18th of May 1995, mm. this is what you wrote. Mr. Schofield sent a submission to my private secretary in response to an urgent request I have made for advice on how other major countries have reacted to hepatitis C infection through blood and blood products. I was told that the information was not readily available, but that Mr. Schofield had asked Dr. Raymond to provide a table showing the position on HIV and hepatitis C for each country later uh, by the close of play the following day. In the meantime, Mr. Schofield advised that, quotes, no consensus has emerged concerning the way in which those who have been damaged non-negligently should be treated. So far as we know, the UK is the first country to put in hand a general mm -hmm. look-back exercise to trace counsel and, where appropriate, treat those infected. We have no hard details of other countries who have set up compensation schemes for those infected with hep C. IRU have asked for details. Uh, and then, on paragraph three, uh, on the 19th of May 1995, Dr. Raymond provided my private secretary with the table of comparisons, stressing that it was the best information that could currently be obtained, but there are bound to be inaccuracies. Five of the countries tabulated had no payment scheme for hepatitis C. Sweden had a scheme, but only for payments after 1990, when a test became available. Austria and the Republic of Ireland had, or were going to have, a payment scheme. Again, why did you ask for that, and how did it inform your thinking? Again, um, I wanted to know. I just don't think you should make policy in a vacuum. Um, any of us can be blinkered, or spoke before about getting um, agency capture, um, sort of indoctrinated by the organisation with which you are working all the time. And I always wanted to sort of cast around for what more we could learn from other countries, from other agencies, and so forth. Uh, and what did you take from the, the minute that you received there from was the, no, Dr. Raymond? There was no, uh, there was no consensus. Um, I was also, you know, I appreciated we'd, 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 the ground had changed before a couple of times and on, on, on a, a, a ring fence we were holding. So it wasn't beyond the bounds of possibility, although, I, as I've said, um, and I don't resile from it, I supported the, the line we were taking then, but it's always conceivable that it will move again, in which case we need to be, you know, forearmed is forewarned, or whatever. Uh, you, indicated yes forearmed. Sorry. <laughs> you indicated yesterday, uh, sorry, but you saw yesterday some of Sir John Major's mm. evidence. Did you see the, the section of his evidence when he was discussing the extension of the yeah. HCV? Yeah, I didn't see it, but I do understand he's, he's had a, has a change of view um, about it. But I find it, I think, I mean, it is quite interesting that we held the line in my term. Mr. Dorrell held the line. I think Mr. Dobson held the line. Alan Milburn certainly held the line. So there are a lot of people who, for very good reason, having the closer you look, the um, more complex it is, and the more, to me, um, you would insist, hold the line, uncomfortable and unpopular as it is. So I don't want to, I mean, I note what Sir John said. I'm going to um, finish my section of the questions before we invite the core participants to put forward those uh, with just a, a, a few of the reflective questions that you were asked and that you address at the end of your statement. If we could have on screen, please, WITN 5289001. It's page 146 of your statement. Uh, page 146, please, Lance. This is a section of a statement where you have been talking about the need to, to balance competing mm. demands within the health budget, and you've noted the interventions of Mr. Heppel, uh, Sir Christopher France, and Sir Graham Hart uh, on the extension of the various schemes. Uh, you say at paragraph 8.6 that you didn't raise those interventions critically, uh, and I will read what you say from the rest of that statement. On the contrary, these were our most senior advisors who were able and impressive and cared about the delivery of our health objectives for the benefit of all patients. Reflecting on matters now, those interventions reveal the intensely difficult tension between one, wanting on a humane and compassionate approach to do more 
for the victims of infected blood and blood products, to the fact that we were already that we were already pushing at and in some cases going over the boundaries of what our most senior officials thought advisable, having regard to the immediate costs and to the wider precedents that more payment schemes would set. However difficult it is to raise in the context of this inquiry and those infected and affected by infected blood and blood products, there were other patients in affected groups who had suffered serious adverse outcomes from medical treatment for whom the moral obligation argument may be said to have applied with similar, if not identical, force. And three, what was achievable in practice? And you go on there to say that the Treasury couldn't, shouldn't be considered in the, the caricature way, but it was a significant break on extending payments. Um, now, looking back at those three balances, uh, those three factors, do you, do you think that you got the balance right during your time in office? And are there any occasions when you think you got it wrong? I acted in good faith. I was diligent. I read the papers. I spoke to the people. In fact, I never made a decision without talking to the people involved. And I had really difficult things to do. I just put this on one side. We'd had report after report about the future of London hospitals, 29 reports, but nobody had ever made any decisions. And I had to make the decisions about you know, which hospitals to merge, close, amalgamate, because we needed fewer, better hospitals. And nobody ever wants to make the unpopular decisions. It's easy to make the popular decisions. But if you're in government, you do have, particularly um, running the health service, to make very difficult decisions. So this, to me, is exactly how it was. I wanted to do more. Um, we were going really fast. I mean, we were going further than we did in advise. Treasury, although I'm very generous about them in the statement, I've explained previously, I had a different view about them as well when I was fighting them. Um, and every decision had an opportunity cost. So if we put more into compensation payments, then there's less for mental health, less for um, uh, child, pe for paediatric health, less for um, uh, dementia. So it's, it's a limited pool. And this was a precedent which if once we'd, once we'd moved, broken this precedent, it would open up, had the potential to open up all across the waterfront. And to me, have a really damaging effect on the NHS, quite apart from the licensing authority, the CSM, and all the other points that we've made. So I did my best at the time. On a distinct but related point, do you think that governments generally are good at robust self-examination and <laughs> accepting where they have made mistakes? Well, select committees love telling governments where they've made any number of mistakes. That's what they're there for. Um, there's a strangeness in politics, maybe in lots of parts of life. You often reap what somebody else sowed. What you sow, somebody else reaps. And it's certainly the truth that if, if you're in the same party, the minister after minister comes along, it's much harder to dismiss a previous minister's views. If the government changes, nobody has any hesitation in saying that the other political party got it all wrong. So I'm sure there's a tendency in government to be reluctant, to be critical about the government of which you have been a part. But I do think that as, as uh, time moves on, uh, there is scrutiny, there is debate. And a lot would say one of the problems in the public sector is there is so much pouring over the past, much more than in other parts of the economy. Um, you know, I was asked to give evidence on the uh, child abuse inquiry. I mean, this is the most extensive inquiry, going back since the beginning of time, practically. Uh, vast expense. Um, and I'm not sure what we'll learn from that. So... Um, I'm not unduly worried on this particular point. 
There are always a lot of people who are happy to tell the government where they got it wrong. Do you think that, that may lead to a sort of de defensive mentality, not just of your a government of your own political persuasion, but also of the department in which you serve and to which you wish yeah, to show loyalty? So in, you were getting at that then some earlier questions, Ms. Neil. Um, I think the, the, a department with expertise is worth its weight in gold. I could navigate you around Whitehall to any number of departments where the uh, top civil servants had no history of the critical issues and the sensitive points. So if you ask me as a Secretary of State, I would go to a department where you know, there were a group of committed, talented civil servants. But if we take, for example, the health reforms, I mean, that um, Ken Clark really took through this, I'm not sure how many of the civil servants really had their heart in that. So a ch change is always possible, and that's, that's the job of the ministers. Um, finally, um, we've seen in the papers a significant role for the Haemophilia Society in influencing government policy mm. and for senior backbench MPs. But little direct contact between ministers and those who were individually affected mm. in the tragedy. Uh, first of all, do you think that is a, a fair assessment of the papers? And secondly, do you think that it would have made a difference to policy if there had been more of an involvement of the individuals rather than representatives mm. or organisations? Well, I think looking back, I would like to have seen a group of the infected and affected. I've said I had my own personal experience, but it, it is interesting that in other fields of my work, I think I did meet um, the patients, the user groups. Um, as I say, I've talked about mental health, I've talked about children's services, I've talked about many other fields. And if it's the case that none of the ministers were seeing groups of um, people who were infected and affected, and it was all happening through the Haemophilia Society and um, the McFarland Trust, that is cause for concern. Um, I don't know whether more people who are infected and affected were having individual meetings with their constituency MPs, which is another way of getting the direct experience through. But I think certainly in today's approach, one would really want to talk directly to the infected and affected. And I cannot say that I did that in my term. Thank you. Those are the questions that I have for you. Uh, so I note the time as well. Yes, well, um let me explain uh, to you first what, what will happen next. Uh, core participants uh, have a, a, of whom there are quite a number in this inquiry, um, ha have the right through their recognised legal representatives to, to, put, uh, ask, to ask counsel to ask further questions of you. Um, a number of the topics that they might have chosen will have been covered in what you've already said what you've already said may give rise to further questions. They have to be given the opportunity to consider those. How long it'll take for them to feed those questions in to council, I don't know. Some uh, of the uh, legal representatives will be here, some will be watching online. Um, it'll be a little while. Um, do you have any sense of how long you might need, Mr Hill? Uh I can't say at the moment. I would have thought at least uh, 30 to 40 minutes. Well, it seems to me that sensibly, if we said not before 4 o'clock, uh, and I can't, I'm afraid, tell you how long it'll be after that. It may be quite quick. If there are a few questions, it may be a lot longer if there are a lot of questions, but it'll be the last lap, as it were. I appreciate so, that. So, not before 4 